Welcome everybody to Friday's lunchtime lecture, and which is a continuation in a series of, of talks given by Steve Previk on constraining geochemical variation in igneous rocks. Uh, I won't say too much about him. Uh, we've introduced him before, but basically Steve is uh, based at Rhodes University. He's a geochemist there and he's been at one time and I think still at the present time head of department. Uh, he's done, not he's moment. not at the moment. He's done his geological moment. training in Canada at McMaster University uh, and has had, uh, uh, and also the University of Alberta where he did his PhD. He has specialized in the acquisition and application of radiogenic isotope data along with geochemistry and petrology to the study of the origins and evolutions of various proterozoic mafic intrusions. Um, I think that's all I really need to say about Steve. And with that, I'll hand over to you and carry on with the third lecture of the series. Thank you very much, Craig. I will disappear my face here. So yes, um, hopefully this will be the, the final installment in this little series. Um, and I'll get through it all in proper good time. So in the first Excuse me, the first episode we looked at magma mixing and magma mingling. In the second one, we looked at crustal contamination and the possible implications of it um, with some reference to ore deposits. And in the third one, we'll look at the effects of differentiation and fractional crystallization, and then the subsolidus processes that mess things up um, and why maybe we should care about them sometimes instead of just treating them like complications. Okay, so what do we mean by differentiation fractional crystallization? Well, the key features are that we are redistributing phases within a system. So our system is normally, let, let's say something like a magma chamber, where you have a mixture of crystals that have been carried in by the magma or those that have formed by crystallization of that magma in the magma chamber and then the residual liquids. And we are separating those from one another. So they are increasingly not interacting in equilibrium necessarily. So the liquid phases, normally we just think of the, the silicate magma, but it also may include exolved volatile phases, which are normally water, especially in normal mafic rocks. Although there are igneous systems like kimberlites and carbonatites, where carbonate fluids can be very important. Um, I mentioned the pressure here as well, just to make the point or to remind us that it's only in the top couple of kilometers where H2O will exist as water, and only if the temperature is low enough. Otherwise, it's a supercritical fluid with properties of both a liquid and a gas. And exactly what that means in terms of how it interacts with rocks and minerals and magmas, I'm not entirely sure. But I think it's something that one should vaguely keep in mind, possibly. Then we can have sulfide liquids, which as immiscible phases not mixing with the silicate magma. And perhaps immiscible iron-rich liquids are um, viable possible presences in these systems. Over the last 10 years, the kind of physical and phase diagram, or let's say theoretical evidence for the existence of immiscible iron-rich liquids has become more prominent again. It never really went away, but it was convenient to ignore it. And there are, so there are systems like these iron-rich um, magnetite hosting layered intrusions in China in particular, where this is considered one of the prominent models. Um, we won't be talking about that today, but it's just a, an additional liquid system that may be involved. The solids that we may be dealing with are mainly the silicate minerals, as well as usually lesser amounts of oxide minerals, such as chromite, magnetite, and then phosphates, which are almost always apatite in these kinds of systems, um, rather than monazite, which we see in granitic rocks. Then we can have the sulfides and related minerals, alloys, 
um, tellurides, bismuthonides, things like that. Um, in theory, we could have carbonate solid minerals, but as magmatic phases, these don't seem to be important generally. So except in those rare carbonatitic magmas where um, magmatic dolomite is crystallized. So we're going to ignore those for the most part. So fractional crystallization is obviously driven by the progressive loss of energy in the system with time, which we see as cooling, drop in temperature in the system. And as we talked about in the previous installment, um, this is driven by or enhanced by contamination. So as we use up energy in the magma to assimilate continental crust, for example, that speeds up the crystallization. So it's, it uses up energy to consume those fragments and that drives further crystallization of new minerals. So that's all kind of going on at the same time. And we've talked about that before, so we won't really be dealing with that again. The processes that control differentiation and fractional crystallization, so this separation of liquid and solid, are kind of in order of significance. The gravity-driven settling of solids, so this was Norman Bowen's um, prime mechanism for driving fractional crystallization. He probably overstated the case somewhat. Um, over the decades, the idea that some minerals might float, particularly plagioclase, whose density is can be less than that of the basaltic magma, um, probably plagioclase doesn't effectively float as a way of really efficiently segregating it from the liquid and producing, say, a north acidic units. Um, it's possible that in evolved compositions where these liquids have become relatively iron rich and denser, it might be a functional process. But that's not what we're looking at, say, in the middle of the bushveld, for example, where we're seeing a north acidic foot walls to chromatite reefs. Then we have the process of compaction, so a kind of filter pressing where the compacting cumulus mineral pile squeezes out the interstitial liquids and they then ascend up through the pile. So in the exact same way as in a sedimentary basin, um, as we push the conate fluids up towards the surface. Um, and the, the role of compaction also seems to depend on the crystallization circumstances. It can't be universally assumed to be happening throughout a layered intrusion necessarily. Lots of textural evidence that suggests in certain cases, such as in the scare guard, there's not effective compaction happening. And then finally, we can have these kind of more localized effects like flow dif differentiation, where um, coarser crystals can be concentrated where the um, maximum carrying capacity of a magma is, such as in the interior of a sill. Um, and if we think of layered intrusions as a sequence of still stacked on top of one another, whether or not the preceding one had completely solidified, the, that may still be relevant here in terms of locally separating crystals from the associated magmas. So having established essentially the ground rules for separating crystals from liquids, what this means is we have a process by which we are removing solid material from the liquids. And so we're removing the chemical components of those solids from the, the liquids overall, so from the system. So hence fractional crystallization rather than equilibrium crystallization. And this means we are changing the composition of the liquid. The liquid is now a residual liquid from which crystals have been removed and they're not coming back. So what effect does that have? Well, one of the effects is that we can induce saturation in phases in the liquid which weren't saturated before, such as sulfides. So in this diagram, we can start with a kind of typical basaltic composition around here where the red dot is. And if we then crystallize typical mafic minerals, such as chromite on the right, olivine in the bottom right, orthopyroxene in brown there, um, 
The pelagic glaze over in the bottom left corner isn't going to be helpful in this regard. Crystallization of pelagic glaze kind of moves the magma composition parallel to the sulfur saturation boundary. The crystallization of all the mafic minerals pushes the liquid composition into the field of sulfur saturation. So just by fractional crystallization of normal mineral assemblages in a sort of noritic, olivine norite kind of assemblage, so essentially what we see in the bottom half of the bushveld, we will produce sulfur saturation, which will give you disseminated sulfides, not necessarily catastrophic economic oversaturation, which is what we are particularly interested in. So how else can we use this kind of process in terms of analyzing the effect on the parent magmas and the rocks and understanding how they work? I'm going to give you a couple of examples. Um, these are from gabbronorites and anorthosites in Ontario, Canada. The diagram on the left is using a plot of calcium versus yttrium, um, a scheme developed by Richard Lambert and colleagues in the 80s, I think, or the very late 70s. And in this case, we can, if we assume a starting composition somewhere in the middle, and normally um, what I used, I've taken the average composition of the whole intrusion, and I've also put average morb, and they're not so different in terms of composition there. And we can plot the positions of the different minerals that would be present. So many of them are off this plot. So for example, clinopyroxene is way up at the top of the diagram, the second order biofringent orange, squid, um, whatever shape that is, octagon. And orthopyroxene down the bottom, olivine down in the lower left corner with next to nothing of anything in it. And then from that, we can describe areas where accumulation of minerals, such as clonopyroxene and plage, would be expected to plot. So we produce gabbros. We could produce norites in the lower part of that diagram. And the residual liquids from those kind of extractions would be found over on the right side. So sample 36 there is perfectly consistent with a residual liquid from which plagioclase has been removed. And other samples there would be consistent with removal of plage and clonopyroxene. So the implication is we're looking in different parts of layered intrusion. We're seeing areas which are more dominated by the cumulus crystals and other areas which are more dominated by the residual liquids. In all cases, it's probably something of a mixture of both. Anorthosites are a nice system to work with because they are mineralogically very simple. Um, this is from the Burwash area in the Grenville province in Canada. So these are one billion year old Namakoland like high grade gneisses hosting anorthosite intrusions. And here we could propose a parent magma composition. In this case, I've compared it with a series of um, dolerite dikes, which are of, of about the same age as the anorthosites, and just use them as a kind of reference for what a mantle partial melt might have looked like at the same time in the same place. And from that accumulation of plagioclase then would produce anorthositic rocks, which are 90% or more plagioclase. So that all works out nicely. And we could then extrapolate as to whether those dikes could even possibly represent residual melts from which plage has been extracted if we started with a more morb-like starting material, or could they have actually been the parents and we're just not seeing the residual liquids. Here's an example from Sudbury, where the, we have a, an impact melt sheet with pockets along its base in which we have a xenolith rich breaches and massive sulfide ores. So there's a strong association of the xenoliths with the, the mass of nickel ores. So it's of some interest to know what the origins of those fragments are. And we can relatively simplistically model that the, the matrix, which is broadly basaltic, um, has been influenced by the accumulation of orthopyroxene and olivine in particular, and the sublayer and offset hosted um, xenoliths fall quite consistently into that range. So we have a mixture of those two. And we can obviously 
it's important to prove that that's realistic in terms of actually looking at the rocks and seeing that, yes, indeed, the rocks are full of cumulus, orthopyroxene, and olivine crystals. There's recrystallized interstitial plagioclase showing in that one there. So other ways of analyzing major element data include the somewhat um, enigmatic Pierce element ratio plots, which I thought I would give a little promotion to. They have now been more generically named as component element ratio plots. So these were developed by Tom Pierce at Queen's University in Canada in Kingston. So these are different from Pierce classification diagrams. Those were developed by Julian Pierce in the UK. And those are these kind of famous and famously abused trace element ternary plots by which you can plot any rock and have it tell you what tectonic setting it came from or not. So the, these Pierce element ratio plots are fundamentally binary plots. But in contrast to a kind of normal Harker diagram, such as this sort of thing, where we plot, say, silica or magnesium against whatever element we like, and we look at the trends and deduce that it's telling us something about the evolution of the liquid composition with progressive fractional crystallization. In the Pierce element ratio diagrams, we design the axes so that the stoichiometry of the minerals we think are controlling it are represented. So I'll illustrate with a simple example now rather than waff waffle on about it. Okay, so the simplest example would be a magma that's crystallizing only olivine. So we have our formula for olivine. So what we're interested in is the proportion of the cations in the Y site here, iron and magnesium. We're gonna ignore things like manganese. Um, so you're sort of by necessity simplifying the system. So the ratio of iron and magnesium to silicon is what's important here. So essentially we're going to plot the site occupancies of the two sites, the Y site and the Z site against each other as the X and Y axis. And that proportion is only going to apply to all of these. As soon as we add pyroxenes or anything else, that will give us a different proportion of those elements against each other. So if we want to test strictly olivine crystallization, we would create a plot that looks like this. So the y-axis is representing the y site, the x-axis is the z site, and we've divided both sides by potassium. So we take an element that doesn't go into the mineral in question, so something incompatible. So in mafic rocks, potassium is suitably incompatible. And what that does is it corrects out kind of dilution effects of whether or not you've got lots or few crystals in any particular whole rock sample. And this example here shows us two different magmas, um, both with the same slope of one, but a different y-intercept. So what this tells us is that these are two different Hawaiian lava flows. And it tells us that yeah, they started from slightly different compositions but then they both crystallized only olivine in the course of this magmatic evolution. So that's what's being tested here. Okay, and there are, I mean, I get all this information from a short course that I participated in, which has lots of these diagrams already prepared. So let's say we want to look at a more complex system than lava flows. We want to look at a layered intrusion. Can we still use this? Yes, but it does get more complicated. So I've taken a diagram designed to show plagioclase, pyroxenes, and olivine crystallization, which kind of covers all your bases. And so the y-axis is now more complicated because it's based on the stoichiometries of those essentially four minerals, OPX, CPX, plage, and olivine. And this was done for this same gabronorite. I, used before. And what we see is a very nice correlation, but the slope is not one. So that suggests that perhaps we're missing one mineral or something that's that's affected the overall slope. Um, it's possible that crustal contamination has sort of 
broadly just produced a mixing line that's superimposed on the Pierce element ratio diagram. And then there's the fact that, yeah, we aren't, we aren't looking at the liquid composition anymore necessarily. We're looking at mixtures of liquids and crystals. So we're also seeing a kind of mixing system from that. So it does get more complicated with intrusive systems, but it's still useful. And the main proponent in my world of this type of modeling is Tony Beswick um, at Laurentian University in Sudbury in Canada. And he's been a, a major proponent of this for probably the last three decades. Um, he's still producing new research on this, presumably sort of post-retirement. So in his applications, he's looking at sulfide minerals. So the stoichiometries are simpler and more flexible. So in this little um, tetrahedron here, we see the positions of copper, nickel, and iron sulfides, the various common magmatic phases. And you can take a plot of nickel over copper versus sulfur over copper for one of the Sudbury mines, McCready West, and you see a nice well-correlated data set, and you might think, okay, that's great. I've got that all sorted out. I understand what's happening. It's full of copper nickel sulfides, but we already knew that. So what Tony's been able to do, and what all this plot is, is zooming in to the bottom left corner of this diagram and resolving trends from very large data sets, decades of collecting by Inco and friends. So he's able to then decipher a progressive evolution. So the formation of an immiscible sulfide liquid, which then at high temperature splits into two separate immiscible liquids, one of which is copper rich and will eventually crystallize to form the immediate intermediate solid solution. And another low copper system, which will eventually form the monosulfide solid solution. And at the time of their separation, their nickel content is not very different from one another. And then gradually as they cool, um, progressive fractionation of, of, of calcopyrite and then pentlandite will cause progressive evolution of the sulfide liquids and influence the ores that are produced. So it can be a very powerful tool for unraveling the history of rocks, but it does take quite a bit of focus. So how about trace elements? If we move away from the major elements, we can look at incompatible trace elements, which are preferred tool for studying liquid evolution patterns. They don't like to go into the crystals, so their abundances and particularly the ratios of these elements, so their abundance relative to one another, can be quite an effective fingerprinting tool for different source contributions. For example, this is a kind of stylized representation of the rare earth profiles for common minerals. I've kind of mixed mafic rocks and granitic rocks in this, just to include all of the, the minerals we might expect. Um, but the feldspars, for example, their position there is what you might expect in mafic rocks. In granitic rocks, they're very close to um, being compatible for some of the elements. So you can't use this as a pure guide. So the problem here is that they can be very useful, and I'll illustrate how in a moment. But we do have to watch um, because they can be susceptible to small amounts of crustal contamination, for example. Depending on what incompatible trace elements we choose, hydrous fluids and metasom metasomatic processes can influence them. So the large ion lithophile elements, the first column or two in the periodic table, um, we want to stay away from if we think um, hydrothermal or hydrated fluid effects are important. Um, compatible elements are going to pretty much tell us the same thing that the major elements told us. So there's not a lot of benefit from investigating them from a modeling perspective here. So let's look at how we can use trace elements. I'm going to show you a couple of examples from recent work I've been doing on granites. The principles are the same as in mafic rocks, but my my best illustrations of mafic rock studies are from my PhD. And unfortunately, that's essentially chiseled into stone and I can't easily access that data to quickly prepare slides from it at the moment. So um, 
on the left we see modeled rare earth profiles for the common minerals in these granites. These have been modeled using partition coefficients acquired from the literature and then um, pretend crystallizing them from a parent magma, which is the dotted black line in the middle of that plot. And then on the right side, what we see is an example of applying this. So what we have there is a parent magma, which is the orange line. And I have attempted to interpret the fact that the range of samples from that unit kind of show the same style of earth profile, like the slope is the same. It's only the europium anomaly that keeps changing from a negative anomaly in the most rare earth rich samples to a positive anomaly in the rare earth poor samples. So logically, the easiest way to do that is to suggest that plagioclase has been redistributed as a solid from the magma in different parts of the intrusion. So I've attempted to model that. So the yellow line at the bottom shows what plagioclase would look like or something like it. And I've tried adding and subtracting 20, 30, 40, 50, 60% plage to see what effect it has. And I couldn't really make that modeling work, but it's a way of testing something. And if you can show that something can't work, that's often just as valuable or even more valuable than just showing what's possible, which is normally the best you can do with modeling. You're not describing unique solutions. The diagram on the bottom shows a different way of looking at rare earth data. So here I'm plotting the slope of the light rare earths as the x-axis, the lanthanum samarium ratio, normalized to chondrites, versus the samarium ytterbium ratio, so effectively the slope of the heavy rare earths. And partial melting of a source to produce another melt should produce a more light rare earth enriched product. And we can look at potential sources and potential melt products and show whether or not they're possible to produce from one another. And we can also look at um, the effect of leaving minerals behind in the source, which is a common feature in granitic systems. So here, for example, garnet and pyroxene are shown. And we can demonstrate that fractionation, so leaving those phases behind, does not help us in the slightest to get from the little blue square to the series of dots above it on this diagram, where the heavy earths seem to have become a bit steeper, but the light earths haven't changed at all. So the implication is that we did not partially melt the source to produce that melt as the sole process. So we can rule out that process by using the trace elements in this way. So what about water? Is this important in this picture? We mentioned that it's one of the components in the liquid. So in earlier sessions, we've talked about the role of water when it's dissolved in the magma, where it changes the phase stability fields of different minerals, particularly spinels like chromite and magnetite. It changes the texture, it can produce pegmatoidal textures. It lowers the melting temperature of the system. But how about when the water is actually exolved as a separate phase? So magmatic water then will form in mafic systems by the time we're at about five weight percent water, we can't keep it dissolved in a basaltic melt anymore at sort of normal crystallization temperatures, say 1200 to 1250. Um, rhyolitic systems, so granitic systems can hold a lot more water. Um, we can get up to six, seven, eight weight percent water. And then we will have water as a separate discrete phase. Um, and we'll talk about what if implications that could have in mafic rocks in a minute. The other participation of water in magmatic systems is the, the commonly referred to system of deuteric alteration. Now, this is a term I grew up with as the kind of excuse for post-crystallization subsolidus water creeping into a cooling mafic intrusion and just messing up your igneous petrology for you. So converting your olivines into hydrated equivalents and your pyroxenes and everything. So it's just seen as a kind of unhelpful overprint, but not an important process. So just something we need to ignore and try to see through. 
And then finally, we'd have hydrothermal processes, which normally we're looking at uh, meteoric water or some combination of meteoric and magmatic water percolating through the rocks and altering them and metasomatizing them potentially. Typically, hydrothermal systems, we're looking at temperatures under 500 degrees, normally under sort of 400, 450. Um, we are not going to deal with these in this because we're sticking to kind of magmatic systems. So these would normally be superimposed on our magmatic system later um, or driven by the heat from it. Um, but these aren't producing alterations of our magmatic system itself. So we're going to, we won't be talking about hydrothermal alterations. So water acts as the host phase for the for preferential accumulation of elements such as the large on lithophiles, which are typically soluble in aqueous solutions, as well as other volatile elements, and most importantly, sulfur and selenium. And especially when sulfur starts complexing with oxygen and then can bond with metals and produce soluble molecules, water can become quite an important component in a magmatic system. So in high temperature systems, possibly with the addition of chlorine to these complex molecules. So calcophile metals, where there's not a sulfide phase for them to go to, such as sulfide solids or a sulfide liquid, they don't want to be in silicates. So if they're in a silicate magmatic system and all the sulfur gets dissolved into an aqueous phase, the calcophile metals may well follow it, especially elements like the PG and copper who have nowhere else to go in the silicates, nobody loves them. So we can move the water around in a magmatic system, particularly through compaction. So this is the most effective way to do it. So we push it through the pore spaces in a permeable mush of crystallizing silicate minerals. It, they may get locally focused in dewatering structures, which we see in volcanic rocks. We're less certain about what those might be in Cumulate systems, but it's possible that things like IRUPs in the Bushveld may represent some aspect like this. So the research camp, which has been representing the model by which upward percolation of late magmatic water is a major player in doing things like lowering the melting temperature. Um, Ed Matei has proposed it as a mechanism for scavenging chrome, for example, from layered intrusions to subsequently precipitate it higher up. Alan Boudreau has stuck to um, using it as a mechanism for scavenging the platinum group metals. Here's Alan in North Carolina in his male menopause mobile here from a few years ago. So here's a model of Alan's that's a quite elegant explanation for the progressive scavenging of the platinum group metals, which I will walk through here. So we start by the emplacement of a mafic magma. So here we are filling up our, injecting our magma into the upper crust. So let's say we're starting with something like weight one weight percent water. You might think this is a little bit high. It doesn't really make a difference to the story. It just means we have to crystallize a little bit more of it before we get water exolving out as a separate phase. But one weight percent water is no longer considered to be anomalously high for mafic magmas. So our magma begins to cool from the bottom up, driving the crystallization of anhydrous mineral phases. Um, so our normal mafic mineral assemblage with plage, along with olivine, pyroxene, chromites. None of these minerals um, are using up water or OHs or anything in their crystallization. That means that the water is being conserved in the residual liquid so in the melt, the water concentration is going up. And eventually, we will reach the point of water saturation. So if we start with 1% water, you can quickly do the math and work out that it's somewhere between 75 and 80% crystallization. We will have achieved water saturation. So the key is that we have enough pore space for that to move around. So the next step here is if once we've consumed all of the sulfur into this aqueous phase, because the sulfur would rather be in a volatile phase, as that liquid ascends by compaction 
those calcophile phases are scavenged and collected and transported with them. They then move up higher in the sequence where water is no longer saturated. The system hasn't crystallized enough yet. And so they re-precipitate back out as sulfides again, while below them the system is solidifying. So essentially, you continue these little episodes of cooling and compaction. So depending on what minerals are crystallizing at any given time, which will have some implication to the compaction rate and the cooling rate, you may at certain times trap that migrating front of sulfides, which will then form a layer of disseminated sulfides. And then as the cooling front passes it by, you may leave some of those behind and start um, this system over again. But it doesn't necessarily have to start from scratch each time. So we'll get a successive sequence of layers of disseminated sulfides. So this is this kind of hydrochromatographic model that Alan Boudreau has proposed. If you're interested in this kind of model, he's written a whole book on it. Um, this was published last year. Unfortunately, I haven't yet worked out a way to get this delivered to South Africa without it costing essentially the same as me flying to a bookstore in London and coming back with it in my bags. And when I did a search online, I forget which one of these this was, exclusive books it was. But I searched for hydromagmatic processes by Alan Boudreau and I got The Lion King as the top search result, even though further down the same list, there were actual layered intrusion books. I showed Alan this as a possible conspiracy to suppress his model, extending to Walt Disney. So now let's look at legitimate post-magmatic processes. So there's what we would describe as alteration, so subsolidus modification. Um, so this can include kind of grain boundary migration type processes or proper retrograde metamorphism. So we're replacing minerals with lower temperature, typically hydrous minerals. And the retrograde step, we can look at them separately as the high temperature reactions and low temperature ones. Um, so the high temperature processes are probably fundamentally isochemical. We are not seeing massive change in the geochemistry of our rock during um, subsolidus post-magmatic processes. We are adding a little bit of water to the rock, normally a couple of percent, and then maybe some of the most mobile soluble alkali metals, elements, such as potassium. At lower temperatures then, we are probably talking about hydrothermal systems where we are pumping water through fractures and so we can have a much, there's much less restriction on what can be transported, dissolved in the water, depending on the local situation. Okay, so the types of effect we can see at high temperature recrystallization. And in these cases, there may still be silicate magmas present, but they are not directly contributing to these systems. They're just providing heat effectively. So we can see recrystallization like the common triple junctions as seen on the left, these are chromites from the flat reef. Um, so the grain boundaries have migrated to form triple junctions. We are seeing anhedral recrystallized textures there, foam texture. On the right, we see this, one of my favorite textures, which is very rarely described, but is, is seen in the bushveld, but this um, very fluid looking grain boundary textural effect in chromites, um, which is understood to be a recrystallization effect as well. You can still see some euhedral grains there, which have kind of necked into adjacent grains. Um, so this is not very common, um, and it has not been seen as any kind of evidence for a chromite liquid, because we believe that to be theoretically virtually impossible because it would require temperatures of something like 1800 degrees. So everybody's happy that this is a secondary recrystallization texture. But the reason I'm going on about it a bit is I'm going to show you magnetite grains, which not look not entirely dissimilar, where people have suggested that this texture suggests that there was a magnetite rich or iron rich immiscible liquid. So just something to keep in mind. 
So if we move to the next level of textural redistribution, so rather than just localized grain boundary migrations, we may um, be seeing that textural reequilibration could be producing really fundamental textures in igneous rocks. So the process known as Ostwald ripening, by which fine grains get consumed at the expense of coarser ones, eventually recrystallizing a rock to a kind of optimum intermediate grain size, can be used to explain um, sort of profound layering features in igneous rocks. And the classic example being the famous Stillwater doublets, which I'm going to show you in a second. But it's also been suggested as possibly contributing to Bushfeld rocks. So Oswald ripening means we so you start with a texturally homogeneous or heterogeneous rock, but the grain size is heterogeneous. And in time, the grain size will coarsen up to a kind of idealized grain size. And this depends on the ratio of the components. So in this example, these are olivines. Um, so depending on how much iron and magnesium is in the system, that will control how much iron you, or how much olivine you produce, which will thus dictate the grain size that is the kind of average optimum one. So this is an experimental study. Um, what we see in other rocks, but I haven't found a good illustration of this, is there can be coarse grains originally as well. They will be consumed partially down to the kind of optimum median grain size. So these are the still water couplets. Picture on the left with Alan Boudreau there. So that's Alan Boudreau photographed in 2016. The paper he wrote about it is in 1995. The Layering is vertical because that area of the still water has been tilted vertically. So I've just tilted the photo back to show the original position of these little um, doublets. So they are paired layers of clinopyroxene in an otherwise anorthosidic rock. This particular relationship is like the scare guard, one of these almost unique um, particular curiosities. And Alan has proposed a mechanism for deriving these based on concentration gradients because sort of standard growth rate nucleation rate models don't seem to functionally explain these textures. So what he's shown here is an explanation based on a dimensionless mathematical modeling in the, the top of this diagram here. And then he has superimposed that onto the layers in the bottom picture. You can see the slightly light gray superposition. If you want to look at this further, yes, it's his, he's written this into a couple of papers. Um, there's a mineralogy and petrology paper, which is the original one, but there I found online open access versions subsequently, which you can see, but it's full of mathematical expressions like this. So be prepared to be taking the conclusion partly on faith. So Moving on then, what other features do we find in minerals as a result of subsolidus cooling? We find local geochemical redistribution through exolution of phases. So for example, on the bottom, well, the top point on my slide here is the clonopyroxene, orthopyroxene lamellae during pyroxene unmixing, and then the subsequent migration of those lamellae to the grain boundaries. And this is something that I talked about in the first talk in this series, so we won't go into it again. Um, but it ends up producing kind of enigmatic looking clonopyroxene rims on orthopyroxene, which you could potentially interpret in various ways. On the bottom left photo, we see magnetites from Panzihua in China. So they're one of these massive magnetite ore deposits. And what we see is the magnetite is dissolving it's evolving ilmenite, which we don't see in this photo, but it's evolving magnesium spinel, pleonaste, and shit, that's an iron spinel, and then also ovospinel as the trellis textured gray exolution network you can see in the background. On the right side, we're looking at Bushfeld chromatites from the flat reef in the northern lobe and chromite labeled as spinel here. 
is evolving along its edges an iron titanium rich variant. So essentially a magnetite evolving out during cooling. This could have implications for mineral separation, for example, among other things, as well as grade. Um, other features that are arising in cooling systems, which may or may not be subsolidus, are illustrated on the bottom left here. So here we see a reaction rim between olivines, which are our orangey minerals in this picture, and it's reacting with plagioclase, the twinned coarse grains, to form orthopyroxene. These orthopyroxenes in this picture are almost all optically continuous radial um, phases on the olivine. And it's believed that those are probably magmatic reactions during a paratectic reaction. So there was actually silicate magma present there. There's an argument though, as to whether the texture that is present on the left hand, upper left hand most grain in the left picture and the picture on the right is showing. This is a olivine grain which has been consumed by reaction between plage and olivine and the white radial layer that's making the triangle is all orthopyroxene. And everybody's fairly happy that that's a replacement texture growing in from the original boundary. But there's a big, there's been argument whether that's a magmatic texture or a secondary replacement texture. And that produces what we refer to as coronitic textures, coronitic gabbros, for example. And that is almost an isochemical process. Only a small amount of water, the compositions of the products and the reactants are virtually identical. Okay, so here's an example where we have magnetites showing a very uh, non-crystallographically controlled boundary with possible inclusions of trapped liquid or resorbed crystals of plagioclase, depending on your perspective. And different slides show, these are from the same intrusion, show textures which could easily be interpreted in different ways. The slide on the top right looks like plagioclase crystals, which are being resorbed by their surroundings, which is actually an an iron rich liquid crystallizing magnetite. They're at that reaction boundary, amphibole is crystallizing. So the iron from the magnetite reacting with the plagioclase. The picture on the top left has been interpreted by some as evidence for um, trapped silicate liquid crystallizing out as plagioclase and olivine and hornblende reacting with or just trapped within an immiscible iron liquid. So we'll move on. So in some cases, the reaction assemblage is lower temperature and hydrous. We're, we're reacting to anhydrous magmatic minerals, plagioclase and olivine, or say plagioclase and spinel, and we're producing amphibole. So it, most people would be quite content, and in fact in the literature they are quite content, to just treat that as a cooling reaction of no consequence. But what we find in some of these is that olivine is one of the products of this reaction. And we see in the picture in the bottom right, there's some second order birefringent blue olivine in there with the horn blends. These are from other iron oxide bearing intrusions from Southwest China, the Baima and Taiha intrusions. Um, we believe that that reaction suggests that you are adding water, but it's still a high temperature system. And this may be re representing magmatic disequilibrium between the iron ores and the silicate liquid, rather than it being a secondary cooling effect, which you can then just disregard. If it's a high temperature disequilibrium effect, it suggests that the ores formed somewhere else than the magma they're currently sitting in and were transported. So it has big implications for ore genesis. So as we move down to the more traditional um, secondary effects, I'm almost done. Um, we, what we expect to see are our primary minerals converting to minerals like chlorite, biotite, amphiboles, titanite. Our iron oxides are converting to low temperature equivalents, so they start dissolving and start breaking down and turn into 
hydroxide aversions like leukoxine. Um, feldspars get saucerotized, so they get replaced by epidote, clinozoocytes, maybe zoocyte, um, chloride, depending on what's around. Um, and so we see the transformation of nice, pretty gabbroic rocks, such as shown on the left from Wikipedia, lots of plagioclase and clinopyroxene. And we end up with rocks like this um, epidote amphibolite facies, upper green schist facies, Luca Gabro, which has been um, subjected to regional metamorphism in the southern province in Ontario and Canada. In many places, you can still see the intercumulus primary texture preserved, but the mineralogy is virtually completely replaced, pseudomorphed by fine grained, low temperature hydrated minerals. Um, the final special case is the case of interaction with carbonates. We've mentioned this a little bit when we talked about magma mixing earlier in the series. Um, in this case, because carbonates are so susceptible to remobilization and they're so reactive, um, they represent a different situation where, where essentially then, um, even in a kind of late magmatic or almost post-magmatic situation, we could kind of induce a magma mixing type relationship where we don't need high temperature magmatic system um, heat in order to produce high degrees of interaction. But we will leave that alone. Uh, just before I say goodbye, I'll just tell you that the background slide for these comes from, um, this is a clouded plagioclase. Um, it's related to the formation of those coronitic gabbros and it's um, a feature of coronitic gabbro formation. And it also goes along with rapid uplift of deep-seated gabbroic rocks that the iron in the plagioclase, which is not a lot of, exolves out as um, iron spinels. And we see them here at the grain size of maybe 10 microns. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks for your attention and patience. And I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, an interesting and well-illustrated talk. Uh, thanks much. Uh, we'll take questions and comments now. If anybody has any, either either raise your hand or go ahead and unmute your mic and fire away. I see no takers at this point. Steve, right. just one one for me in terms of alteration and deuteric processes. It's of course a very important issue when it comes to um, highly alkaline and volatile rich melts. Sure. Now, presumably you're gonna get more and more varied, more, more effect and more varied effect as you raise the volatile content of some of these uh, residual magmas and, and melts and things. Absolutely. Is that a fair statement yeah. to make? Yes, so granitic systems, for example, it's gonna be a much more prominent thing and it can drive ore deposit formation and pegmatoids and fluorite deposits and things like that. Um, and even, um, well, we see in the Zyplatz type tin deposits. So even outside the intrusion, there's enough magmatic water. Um, so yes, and then, yeah, as you say, the volatile rich alkaline, the, 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 uh, the Roger Mitchell whole class of magmas, so orangeites, mangerites, kimberlites, carbonatites, I, I would think that would be quite significant in, in that whole landscape. Yeah, thank you for that. Um, any other questions or comments? Um, I don't see any, any other, any other uh, contributions. Uh, just to let people know, we will be uh, posting this uh, lecture on the YouTube, GSSA YouTube video channel. So it will come on probably early next week. Um, any last chance for comments or queries? Going once, going twice. It looks like you sold the deal, Steve. <laughs>
So very with much. that, thank you. Thank you very much for uh, this third in a series of lectures. Um, I'll be going back over this once again, I think, in the coming days. Uh, right. So thank you very much. Thank you to our delegates for tuning in, and I hope you it was useful for you. So with a hi, Helka. Hey, Steve. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so with that, I'll close the meeting. Thank you, Thanks, everybody. thanks again, Steve. Thank See you for part four. <laughs> Ciao.